introduce our honored guest speaker for the session, Dr. Wan Iswin Najla Wan Hassan of Park City Medical Center. Now, uh, Dr. Wan will talk. Uh, Dr. Wan's talk will focus on how to keep healthy and active in your golden years. It includes tips to keep the mind active and uh, some healthy eating advice as well, which is wonderful, among other things. So with that, uh, Dr. Wan Iswin, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the lovely introduction. Uh, so I'm Dr. Iswin. Uh, I'm a consultant geriatric psychiatrist uh, working at Park City Medical Center. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I hope you can see that. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so today's talk is going to be focusing on keeping a healthy mental health and brain. Um, so as we become older, we will start to notice some cognitive difficulties and some even emotional difficulties. Uh, so this talk focuses on um, addressing some of the issues and I guess also some education on how to prevent um, uh, developing uh, mental disorders in the elderly, um, as well as reducing chances of developing cognitive disorders like uh, dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease and many more. So just a short introduction. So we know that the older people in the golden years, they have a complex mental and physical health needs. Um, there's a lot of interaction. Um, they usually have, they're, they're more likely to develop um, age-related health problems. Um, they're more likely to have um, other needs, uh, for example, financial needs, social, emotional needs. So these have a lot of interaction between the cognitive um, and the functional in the mental health disorders. And also older people have a lot of complex comorbidities. Uh, they may have diabetes, hypertension, um, high cholesterol. Um, they have pain, for example, arthritis, back pain, various others. And also they are experiencing a different phase in their life. So we hear about various things like empty nest syndrome. So that's when the children grow up and leave. Uh, they may be experiencing bereavement, such as their partners passing away um, and leaving them or they may experience a loss of independence. Um, you know, we've, I've had a lot of experience uh, following the MCO of, um, you know, patients being taken away from their hometown and, you know, being uh, taken to live with their family, their children, because they don't want to leave their parents all on their own during the MCO being lonely. So, you know, those can be quite difficult as well um, to, to the older people. And I guess there's, I mean, there's also different life stresses. So for example, older people may have financial difficulties. Um, they may be experiencing bereavement, losses, physical health problems, operations. Uh, they're worried about their children. So the life stresses can be a bit different to uh, the, the younger people, the younger population. Um, and of course, they have different social care needs. Um, they may require more help at home, for example, uh, to help with their um, activities of daily living. Uh, they may find themselves losing a lot of independence or needing help to cook, uh, needing help to have food, uh, needing help uh, to change diapers, for example, if they have incontinence. So there's a different, uh, it's a different social care needs to how they were when they are younger. So, you know, being older, um, you know, I think being is, is fabulous, uh, which is what Amazing Seniors is about. However, it also can come with a whole host of other issues. So, I mean, this is just kind of a start with a bit of introduction that, you know, um, older people uh, can suffer from mental disorders. Um, and the most common one is depression and anxiety. Um, and I think this is something that we often observe uh, among our loved ones or the people that we know. And it's something that I see as a geriatric psychiatrist quite commonly as well. Um, and we think that the depression prevalence in Malaysia is about 30%. And in Singapore, they did a study about psychotic symptoms, and it's about 5.2% prevalence. Um, and anxiety is the most common one that I usually see in my clinic. Um, you know, the overall prevalence about 6 to 12%, can be 20%, um, can be higher perhaps due to the pandemic. And also suicide rates are higher in the elderly population uh, due to multiple various factors. Um, and, and actually, uh, for us as clinicians, uh, being older puts, um, you know, it, it's a higher risk factor um, of uh, committing suicide. And um, older age is not a risk factor to develop mental illness. Um, however, in fact, 
people might think that being older means you're more likely to develop mental illness, but in actual reality, um, older people are actually able to cope better with their life stresses without necessarily developing mental illness. And it may be that they have developed maturity, resilience, um, you know, their own emotional techniques of managing um, any difficulties in their life. So being older doesn't necessarily mean you're more likely to develop um, mental health disorders, but you may be also exposed to other factors that could predispose you. So these are the kind of the late life stresses that we observe that affects older people. Uh, so for example, um, death of a loved one, I've talked about bereavement, about passing of people that you love and, and not necessarily their spouses, it could be their friends, family members, or even their own children, uh, which can be quite, quite upsetting for the older generation. Caregiving role, uh, we know a lot about carers. Um, I see them quite a lot in my own clinic, looking after a person that's just had stroke or just older or frailer can be quite stressful. Uh, loss of independence or loss of role uh, can also be a risk factor uh, or, or stressor. Uh, so for example, um, you know, someone older may, may drive, but due to multiple health problems, uh, due to all sorts of issues, may find it difficult to drive and rely on their children. And the children may not necessarily have the time to take them to where they'd like to go, and they might find it hard to order grab. So a loss of independence is also a stressor for them. Loneliness and social isolation. Um, you know, being older doesn't necessarily mean you'll be lonely or socially isolated, but it may mean that you lose quite a lot of the uh, the things that uh, can help with your, uh, you know, social social um, availability. So, for example, you may find it harder to go and meet friends and see people. Um, you don't go to work anymore, so you're not going to see your workmates. So it might be a lot harder and to to meet people like you used to when you're younger. And I talked about financial worries, um, so not saving enough money, not having enough money, not having enough pension. Uh, that could be a stressor, especially if they are faced with huge medical bills, for example, or if there's something that they need to purchase or pay, like regular bills. Um, and of course, quite commonly that we see as a stressor for older people is having physical health conditions, um, having diabetes and having to watch what they have to eat, um, having pain from various arthritis, uh, joint pains, um, and having heart problems, breathlessness, you know, having leg pain, swelling of the legs, those things can really, really affect older people and be quite a significant source of stress for them. So, um, so uh, after sharing with you all the sort of grimness of being older, uh, let's talk about something uh, a bit more happy. Uh, which is brain health. So brain health is a, it's not a new concept, but it is a concept that is starting to gain momentum um, in Malaysia, as well as especially in the Western countries. So instead of sort of trying to look at how we, um, how we treat dementia, instead of, you know, dementia treatment is very hard. At the moment, it's extremely slow, the research around it. There's not been a major breakthrough for many, many years. So a lot of the focus now um, in conferences that I attend um, and, and sort of the, the training is into brain health. And that's about uh, preserving function or preventing further deterioration in brain function. So the aim now is about educating people about uh, keeping a healthy mind rather than allowing the mind to become unhealthy and finding treatment um, for it. Uh, so that's where the focus is now um, currently on in terms of the research world. So brain health uh, covers a lot of things. It's not just about your cognitive abilities. Um, it covers about your cognitive health, of course, how well you think, you learn, you remember, your motor function. So that includes important things, especially for the elderly, like balance. Um, and it also looks at, you know, it's, it's also about emotional function, how well you interpret and you respond to emotions which are both pleasant and unpleasant and and these are kind of the things that I think sometimes caregivers notice as well that uh, sometimes uh, the seniors the people that they look after um, may lose their temper very quickly or they may be a bit disinhibited saying hurtful things without meaning so that can be an aspect of brain health how you control your emotions how you regulate your feelings and your emotions and tactile functions is, you know, again, about multi-sensory, not, not necessarily touch, 
uh, but that can include um, you know, being able to feel things around you um, and respond to things, um, including sensations, pressure, pain, temperature. So brain health in itself can be affected by all sorts of things. Uh, it could be uh, injuries such as stroke or trauma, um, Alzheimer's disease. It could be things like mood disorders, having depression, uh, substance use or addiction. And we're not just talking about alcohol. We're also talking about addiction to uh, prescription medication, um, which can actually be quite common in the elderly. Um, and, and all sorts of, of multitude of different things that can affect the changes in the brain. And while some factors that affect brain health you can't really change, there are lifestyle changes that might make a difference. So I'll be sort of focusing on kind of the different aspects of that. Uh, so keeping a healthy mind, so I'll be talking about, uh, talking about the taking care of your physical health uh, and all these things that's on this slide. Um, and my uh, lovely colleague, uh, Ms. Pejun will be talking more about keeping a healthy mind from a psychological aspect, um, you know, from a mental health kind of aspect. So it's very important that you, of course, take care of your physical health. So when we talk about physical health, it's more than just exercising. It's also things like making sure that you keep your balance, making sure that you keep your blood pressure under control, making sure that if you are prescribed medication for your physical health, like your diabetes medication, um, like your uh, blood pressure medication, your blood thinners, that you do take them regularly. Um, I think sometimes we do take physical health for granted, but your physical health is closely related to your mental health and missing your medication or not looking after your physical health very well uh, can significantly and adversely affect your brain health as well. Um, so exercise regularly, I think, um, as mentioned by the NC earlier, uh, there's going to be an exercise session, I believe, um, at 4 p.m. Uh, and, and there's lots of, like, and when people talk about exercise for seniors, um, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm asking you to go for a jog around your housing area. It may mean a regular walk, taking your dog out for a walk. It may mean if you are frailer, a walk around the garden, um, or it could be just, you know, doing a little bit of cycling on a stationary bike just for a short while, or doing chair-based exercises. So we're talking about just pumping the, you know, pumping the heart uh, and keeping the brain oxygenated, raising your heart rate, those are the kind of things that really, really help to keep your brain healthy. And it also lowers your blood pressure and it does a multitude of things. So um, taking care of your physical health is extremely important um, as part of keeping a healthy mind. Um, manage high blood pressure. Again, um, we often don't look after our blood pressure very well. Um, health screenings are excellent because it's a way that we at least identify that we have high blood pressure problems. Um, a lot of people wait till they are in their 40, you know, in their 60s and their 80s before they have their blood pressure check. But actually, in reality, hypertension tends to start quite early. Uh, there's plenty of 30-year-olds and even 25-year-olds I know um, that have got high blood pressure. And, and we really need to learn how to manage our blood pressure uh, significantly better. Uh, there is a study called the SPRINT study, which uh, looks at how... Um, High blood pressure is related to increasing the risk of developing uh, mild cognitive impairment, which in turn can increase your risk of developing dementia. So it's very important that you do maintain a satisfactory blood pressure um, by either taking medication or cutting down your salt intake or exercising or eating healthily. So coming down to healthy foods, and I think this is what people are always interested in. So the, the kind of healthy foods, so we're talking about I guess what is healthy in general, so low in fat, um, things that are low in salt, um, you know, things that are low in sugar. So, of course, those are the basic things that we need to think about when we talk about healthy foods. Uh, but from a research point of view, the kind of studies, um, you know, that looks at the, the kind of food that we should be taking, um, the, the positive results are mostly from things like um, the Mediterranean, diet or the DASH study, the, the DASH diet, which is um, uh, taking an adequate diet to reduce hypertension. Uh, so those are the kind of uh, studies that look at um, eating healthy food that would help your brain health. So Mediterranean studies, uh, Mediterranean food 
uh, looks at um, eating things that have got a lot of oily fish. So salmon, uh, kambong, mackerel, um, tuna. So those are quite healthy fish to eat. And cutting down, I guess, the, the less healthy things like red meat, for example. And also looks at things like um, eating green vegetables, green leafy vegetables, kale, broccoli, spinach. Uh, so anything that's got vitamin K, that's quite healthy. Um, and also other things that I think we often lack um, in our Malaysian diet, especially is vitamin D. So vitamin D is quite important um, for your um, nerve development, so your nerves, uh, your neural development. So that actually helps um, in, in keeping your brain healthy as well. So vitamin B, thiamine, uh, B12. Um, so sometimes in you know, a part of your health checkup would also be useful to look into whether you have any deficiencies in this vitamin. And if you do have any deficiencies, it's quite useful to, uh, to take supplements uh, to, to assist with that. Another thing that's very important as well is folic acid. So as part of what we do, for example, um, in dementia screening, is also to look at whether the person has enough of these vital vitamins in their blood, uh, because sometimes supplementing this could also help with, uh, you know, with, with some of their cognitive function. Not necessarily reverse it, but may help reduce uh, the, the cognitive difficulties that they're facing. So very important to check that you have enough of these vitamins and eat a lot of healthy foods that contain these vitamins. And I talked earlier about being physically active as part of taking care of your physical health. And being physically active uh, does a lot of benefit. And I'm not just talking about sort of in terms of for mental health, like uh, for, for, for cognitive uh, difficulties like dementia. It also helps especially with um, depression and anxiety. Part of the treatment whenever people come and see me is that I always encourage um, physical activity. Uh, go for a walk, um, you know, open your senses, you know, smell what the neighbor's cooking, look at the greenery, enjoy your time out for a walk, um, you know, listen to the sights and the sounds. Uh, being physically active is linked to many, many important things, um, you know, including with lowering heart disease, um, in improving your mental health, um, and, and definitely we've seen links with it, reducing risk of developing things like vascular dementia, for example, which is often closely linked uh, with poor physical activity and hypertension. And keeping your mind active, uh, uh, Peijun, my colleague, will be talking a little bit more about that part, uh, but the things that we can do to keep our mind active, just to touch base a little bit, would include um, socializing, uh, talking to your friends, seeing people, uh, doing quizzes, uh, doing crosswords, um, Sudoku. Um, although there's no strong link between sort of games, for example, you know, going to brain training and prevention of dementia, we do find that that actually helps with keeping the mind stimulated. There's a lot of studies going on at the moment looking at whether you know there are certain apps or certain games uh, that could help with reducing or improving cognitive functioning or reducing risk of developing dementia, but a lot of these things actually currently take time. But we do know that keeping your mind active, just in general, um, you know, even if it means just talking to people. Um, another thing that we find is also helpful is learning a new language, um, trying to learn something new. Uh, just because you're a senior does not necessarily mean that you can't learn something new. But research has found that by learning something new, like a new skill, you create new connections in your brain and you also help to replace the old connections in your brain. So basically you're restructuring your brain function, you're structuring your nerves in your brain. So that can really, really help um, with, with, uh, you know, with, with improving your mood, uh, but also with uh, you know, reducing your risk of developing cognitive disorders. And staying connected with social activities, very, very important. Um, when it was during the MCO, that was quite difficult to achieve. Uh, it was difficult for us to see our families or friends uh, now that there's a bit more relaxation. Hopefully people will start to see um, friends and family a bit more um, and start getting connected. And social activities have all been linked uh, with improving mental health and well-being as well as um, reducing risk of cognitive disorders. Part of, in fact, part of what we do um, as therapy for people with dementia is what we call cognitive stimulation therapy. And it's the combination of not only um, the activities, you know, that stimulates the minds, the things like that makes you think, but we also look at the social aspect, actually, of seeing people. Um, 
befriending new people. I've had people who join these kind of groups when they go out and see it, you know, they, they meet new people, they talk to new people, they come back much brighter and they move happier, they sleep better. So social activity is very important. We are social creatures as humans, so don't dismiss the importance of staying social um, as much as possible. Um, and I think, you know, earlier there were talks about sort of trips uh, run by amazing seniors, um, as well as U3A. So now that things are opening up a bit, you know, please, please do keep socially active. Um, and if you're not a person that likes doing groups and you're still scared of COVID, um, you know, try and do something online maybe, or pick up the phone and, and ring friends, you know, talk about things that happened in the past or your school days, anything uh, that you enjoy. Managing stress, again, stress is a risk factor of causing all sorts of, um, you know, uh, mental disorders um, and cognitive disorders as well. So managing stress is very important. So there's a lots of things that we can do to help manage our stress. Uh, that's relaxation. Um, so I always advocate people to um, you know, spend some time every day uh, to do some relaxation, meditation or mindfulness. Mindfulness is uh, something that's quite useful uh, that you can look up uh, and it's about kind of connecting and grounding yourself with your surroundings deep breathing exercises. So those are very good at helping us to manage stress. And, and you know, if we do find that we have a lot of stress in our lives, you can do things that are useful. For example, you can talk to a counselor, you can talk to family and friends, or you can make a list of things that you find is stressing you um, and look at ways that you can manage this stress or how you can eliminate this stress. So there's many ways that you can manage your stress. And, and if you feel that you're really, really struggling and it's starting to affect your mental health or you can't sleep or you can't, you know, you have a poor appetite or you can't do anything around the house, it's best then to seek mental health support. And finally, we talk about reducing risks to cognitive health. Um, so things that can worsen cognitive health or predispose you to, uh, you know, to, 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 um, to suffer from something from dementia, for example. I mean, there are things that you cannot change, like genetics, unfortunately. However, there are modifiable risk factors. So for example, there are certain medications that can impair memory. Uh, so if you do find that you're taking something and your memory is worsened, it's very useful to have that checked out uh, by the doctor prescribing to see whether that's not the cause of the memory difficulties. Other things is sort of brain injury. Um, so uh, there are associations with people who have repeated head injuries and developing cognitive disorders in later lives, so people like footballers, boxers. Uh, so try to reduce any form of head injury um, if possible. Um, and other things that could affect your cognitive health you, you could, could, be, um, could be things like infections. So especially in the elderly, very, very important to keep yourself well hydrated, avoid things like getting a urinary tract infection or chest infection, because those are the kind of things that would uh, predispose you to developing delirium, which is um, a, a form of physical health disorder, which can cause confusion, agitation, um, and, um, and also, you know, making sure that you keep yourself uh, healthy, avoid, you know, unnecessary operations. For example. So there's a few things that you can do to you know, reduce the risk of, of um, you know, suffering from disorders that could affect your cognition. Um, so I've come to the end of my talk and um, I hope Pajun can um, join, uh, you know, uh, complete the rest of the talk about keeping mind active. And at the end of the session, after Pajun finishes the session, we can have a short Q&A session where we can answer some questions. Yes, yes, that's right. Thanks, Dr. Wan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick introduction of uh, Ms. Tan Pei-jun as well. Uh, Ms. Tan Pei-jun attained her Master's in Clinical Psychology from uh, Health University. She has almost 10 years of experience in handling diverse age groups of clients, including students, children, teenagers, adults, and, and even people who are ill. And um, I believe uh, Ms. Tan will be touching on things that you can do to keep your mind active and your uh, mind active and stimulated as well. So Ms. Tan, if you're ready, the floor is yours. And as Dr. Wan mentioned earlier, we'll have the Q&A uh, at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Dr. Iswin. Uh, Dr. Iswin, can you please unshare your screen so that I can share mine? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to share a little bit more about how to keep our mind active, specifically on, you know, on some of the techniques and or maybe you can say some of the tips, right? Um, hopefully you can see my slides here. No issues, right? Now, okay, now before I start, just going through quickly what is healthy aging, right? So when we talk about, you know, aging and all that, as what Dr. Iswin mentioned earlier, there are a lot of things that we, we might be facing. So when in healthy aging, the definition is by WHO is the process of I, um, developing um, and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. In general, it means that, sorry. So, so sorry, sorry. to interrupt you. Yeah. But your slide is uh, not showing in full. I see. I already put it presenting oh, okay. slides. Is that okay now? Uh, let me just share. Ah, yes. Now it's better. Yeah. Thank you very much. Carry right. On. Sorry. Some technical error with the laptop. <laughs> All right. So now, now in short, right? Healthy aging is actually saying that a person, you know, uh, uh, the senior citizens, they are able to be independent, right? To be, you know, to able to meet the basic needs means that they can actually take care of them themselves, right? Their basic need, they can brush their teeth themselves, they can go and shower by themselves. This is called the, need, the basic needs. And of course, at the same time, they can also learn and grow and make decisions, right? For themselves, right? Be mobile, they are able to travel to places by themselves. They are still able to build and maintain the relationships with other people, the friends, all right? Or even they can contribute to the society as well, right? As what Penny shared earlier, there, there are some volunteer work that you know you can actually look into as well, right? So what I want to say here is growing older doesn't mean that your mental, mental abilities will be getting lower or decrease in uh, your mental abilities, right? You can actually keep your mind sharp and alert. Just for an example, you know, our ex-Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir, right? 90 old years old. He is still very alert and he can be our Prime Minister as well. So that's healthy aging. So now let's look into very specifically what are some of the, you know, tips or methods to keep your mind active. As you can see, there are a lot of um, things which, I mean, the methods you can see is actually overlapping with what uh, Dr. Iswin say, right? So this is more, uh, I can say it's more details, right? And more specific uh, uh, tips for you all, right? So the first one, how do we keep our mind active? Of course, what Dr. Iswin has explained quite a lot just now, right? To keep you uh, physically active, right? What kind of exercise? So just to share a little bit more, right? Um, to how do we keep ourselves active? We have to keep about 75 to 150 minutes of exercise per week. It's not per day, yeah? per week. For senior citizens, right, you have to see what are you know, your maybe health conditions or maybe your abilities, you know, what kind of exercise that you can do. I'm not asking you to go and do marathon if you are not able to. You know, right? So you, you can maybe do a brisk walking as what Dr. Isfin said or if you are maybe more healthier, right? You are healthier, you always go for marathon, you can go for jogging, you can do a biking or maybe stationary cycling as what Dr. Isfin said, right? Some dancing, marching, uh, swimming or chair yoga. These are the things that are more suitable for the elderly, right? So if you can't make it 75 to 150 minutes, right? At least make it 10 minutes walks throughout the day. That will be helpful as well. Yeah. So secondly, mentally active, right? As what Dr. Isvin shared, quite some uh, brain games, right? Like crossword puzzles, scrabbles, chess, shodoku, cards, all these can stimulate our brain, right? And of course, not only games, right? You can also do volunteer works because you need to talk to people. We are using our brain to, you know, to think and make decisions and all that, right? You can play musical instruments. It can be one of the, you know, learning something new, right? Read newspapers, all these keep our minds active. Other than that, you can also do some coverings, right? Um, you can search for 
colorings online and there are so many things that you can actually download just to color or maybe you can uh, search for mandala m-a-n-d-a-l-a -A mandala colorings it can even make you calmer and less anxious as well when you are coloring it yeah other than that you can also look into artwork craft projects you know a uh, word search or maybe uh, learn a new hobby such as gardening, photography, uh, new language, um, what else? Maybe uh, like what I said just now, uh, uh, new skills, you know, in um, playing the musical instruments, right? So all these things can help you to keep thinking, keep learning, keep your mind active. Yeah. So these are some of the examples of the free online games. You can simply search online. You just put brain games, B-R-A-I-N, brain. So all the games will come out. You just need to see what kind of games that you want to look into. Or maybe you can just play every other things, you know, different categories. There are games for the short-term memory, short-term memory. There are games for naming, you know, all your vocabularies, you know, uh, uh, word search, all the things will be come out from here. You can game, you know, play the games on the working memory, um, processing speed, how fast you can, you know, respond to those things, right? Or, or even planning, right? Making decisions, you know, or maybe some escape games. All this actually helps to stimulate our brain, yeah? And even you can try some IQ test game, right? They, in the IQ test game, they actually look into different uh, cognitive abilities, right? It's not only just, just, for example, your knowledge on something. It will be including your processing speed, your working memories, you know, your, your general knowledge. Everything will be inside one IQ game, right? So other than that, how do we keep ourselves active as well, right? As what Dr. Isbin said, we have to stay socially active. We have to stay connected with others, right? So this can actually reduce the risk for mental health issues as what, you, what Dr. Isbin has shared quite a lot just now, right? You know, what are the risks of um, being uh, isolated, you know, being loneliness and all that, right? So it's more like creating a sense of belonging, right? So, of course, during this um, pandemic, you know, we, we can't really meet others. Maybe right now, since they're really open, you can maybe pay a friend a visit, just one or two friends instead of in a big group. You know, you can just following, um, you know, the strict SOP, you know, to protect yourself and also your friends, right? So all these things can be adjusted, um, as, you know, to the earlier as although you can't really do like gathering and hugging like in the past, but I guess at least there are something, right? With your friends and family or relatives, right? And here I actually put in some family activities. Why do I put in family activities? Because a lot of time uh, when we look into elderly, right? Uh, they may not be maybe physically active. They may not be... Uh, outgoing kind of persons that just sit there and you know and um, maybe most of the time being alone right so you maybe you as a son right um, or maybe you as an elderly you can suggest to your children right what you know you can do it together because when your family members you know come along together you will definitely you know have more uh, fun and also you will actually do it, right? For example, exercise, I ask you to go and, you know, go and walk alone. You may not be that, you know, I'm, I'm just being lazy, you know, so boring. But when you go out for a walk together with your family members, then that's different, right? So this is, I would say, family activities is very important, especially for the elderly and especially for those who are not technology savvy, I would say. All right, so for example, you can have family picnic, you know, or maybe play games with the children or even grandchildren, right? For example, the spelling, it can be the board games, it can be the online games, right? Right, spelling, memory, mathematics, all these are fun games together with the family members, right? Or maybe you can just watch the TV shows, you know, something that maybe you've never seen before or something, or maybe uh, a, a documentary, 
and then you can actually talk about it, discuss about the TV shows together with your family, right? So have fun with col adult colorings together or scrapbooks. So this is what I said just now, right? You can also do coloring yourself, but when you are doing coloring with your family members, then that's a lot more fun, right? So um, phone or video calls with family, relatives or friends, um, or even you can have a culture day, you know, you can watch a foreign film, you can cook, a, you know, the meal for that foreign film, or it, you have a team, you know, to, to create some difference or some fun in your family, right? And then, as I said just now, physical exercise, you may be, you know, boring to do it alone, lazy to do it alone, but you can actually do it together with your family members, right? Or maybe... You, your, uh, let's say you as a child, right? You see your mother always sit there and then you just ask your mother along, right? Let's go for a walk. Or maybe you on the YouTube and, you know, do some aerobics or, I mean, of course, the, the soft aerobics, right? And then you say, okay, let's join me and, you know, move around together. Just so, so all these things, it can be adjusted. It's just see how do we, you know, uh, um, make adjustment and how do we do it with our family members, yeah? So I think um, I will just stop there. But um, just for your information, right, if you want to have some memory health check, you know, which will be done by Dr. Isvin, you can also look into the Amazing Seniors platform. We do have a memory health check there with a lot of discount over there. And also if you need more uh, uh, questions, maybe you have some questions on how to manage or something like that, you know, you can actually look for me uh, or our clinical psychologist, right? We, there is a psychology consultation sessions in the amazing platforms. And another one, if let's say you just need someone to listen to you, um, it doesn't have any issue, but you are just boring and no one to talk to, you can also look for us, which is under the package of here for you consultation. All right, so I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan. Thank you very much. And to Dr. Wan Iswin as well earlier. Uh, just before we move into the Q&A, we do have some questions for the two of you. Um, folks, this is just for you guys, amazing seniors who have taken the time to join us here uh, over the last three days and today as well. Be sure to check out um, Park City Medical's uh, medical screening packages um, and also psychological consultation sessions, memory health checks, talk therapy. They are, these are all provided at discounted rates just for amazing seniors. Those, just for those of you who have uh, uh, joined our launch program, you can find these deals on www.amazingseniors.my under the deal section. Just look under the health and wellness category and all the packages are, are offered over there. So once again, uh, Ms. Tan and Dr. Wan, thanks for your um, talks earlier. We'll get into the questions. We've got a few here. So um, I'll just open it up to the two of you and, and you can decide who would be uh, better to answer those questions. Uh, sorry, you're very answer. soft. You're very soft. I can't hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Still soft. Still soft. Okay. Okay, okay. Just one second, yeah? Just one second. Yeah? Just a minute. Uh, just a second. Technical, now, better. Technical. now better. All right, we'll just go on with the session. Okay, uh, let's go into the questions. Um, I'm going to go backwards. Um, Sharon just shared with us that her 84-year-old mom has dementia and she goes through family photos with her weekly. Um, th does, that, does that actually work? Uh, yes, uh, family um, looking at through pictures or sometimes I also call it reminiscence therapy uh, is actually quite well evidenced. Um, I find that especially looking at old pictures, um, very, very helpful, especially calming down people with dementia. Uh, they can sometimes feel very anxious or distressed if you try and show them or introduce new people in their life. So going through old pictures um, is also a very useful activity. Or if you have a magazine that has got places that she used to go when she was younger, those are also quite, quite useful. So uh, Sharon, uh, what you're doing is uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, so please continue. Okay, Min's Chin has also mentioned, some research has shown that coconut oil helped with uh, dementia. What's your opinion on this? 
Um, so um, the research around coconut oil and dementia, so a lot of my patients do ask about it. Um, at the moment, the evidence, the link between it isn't very strong. And the, the research that's been published is usually uh, quite small numbers uh, by scientific uh, standards. Um, however, there are sort of a lot of anecdotal evidences, you know, people saying that they do find that there's improvement in the cognitive function. It comes down to I guess the belief that dementia is related to a lack of glucose going to the brain and uh, coconut oil is supposedly helping with providing the glucose metabolism to the brain. Uh, so that's why um, you know, people are trying uh, the coconut oil um, uh, for, for their loved ones. And I mean, at the end of the day, I, I don't have any issues with people uh, trying all sorts of supplements. I think when you are looking after a loved one with dementia, you want to try everything uh, in the world, basically. Uh, to help make things better and if they're not causing any harm to the person and if you feel that it's not costly and it's not causing any um, side effects or problems please please go ahead and uh, you know same with the oily fish uh, same with giving them massage therapy reminiscent therapy you know there are there are things out there that i think can help besides just the prescribed medication Okay, on, on that same note then, Doctor, um, there, there was a question earlier, Zarifa, who mentioned, can you suggest some common supplements for 50s and above? Um, so common supplements, I mean, uh, supplements is always very difficult because I, I, um, you know, I don't want to be seen like I'm advertising anything specific. Uh, but in terms of common supplement vitamins, specific vitamins to take, um, so things that have got vitamin B, so even my mother, I make sure that she takes the vitamin B. It's good for her nerves because she's got diabetes. It's also good for brain. So things with vitamin B and thymine. Uh, we do quite a few. There's a bit of few research looking at links between um, taking vitamin B in mild cognitive impairment and uh, preventing it developing into dementia. So those can be quite useful to take the vitamin Bs. Um, other things that I've spoken about, things that are, you know, it's about healthy eating. If you eat healthily, you don't necessarily have to have the supplements. And of course, checking that you don't have certain deficiencies. So having a health screening, uh, so part of our memory package, I also screen for deficient vitamins that you may have, which I may have to correct. For example, folic acid, vitamin B12, thymine. So, um, and of course, things like low thyroid. So we do look at, uh, you know, so those are the kind of things that we look at. There are reversible causes for the memory problem. But in terms of dementia and, and you know, or preventing dementia, and supplements, if you stick to the healthy eating, the Mediterranean diet that I've spoken about, that can be quite helpful. Um, also nuts, and um, there's also a lot of evidence on um, fruits that have got antioxidants, so strawberries, blackberries, um, so they're quite good as well. Okay, uh, okay, one more question here from Belinda Koch. Um, where can I get assessment for dementia? Um, hubby is in her his early 60s, and he tends to forget. Um, so the kind of people who, um, who you can see um, for uh, dementia are uh, people, for example, neurologists um, at any hospital uh, can help you uh, do an assessment. Um, for someone who's quite young, um, you know, sometimes I always want to make sure that they don't have depression. Depression is quite common and it can mimic dementia uh, quite easily, especially in your, if you are younger and you're not in your 80s and you're quite young. So if your hubby is 60 years old, uh, it would be good to make sure that he's not just depressed and it's not dementia. Uh, so people that are useful to see if you're concerned, whether it's one or the other, uh, would ideally be a geriatric psychiatrist like myself. But if you can't find one, a psychiatrist would be helpful. Uh, a neurologist would also be helpful. Um, or a general psychiatrist, although they may not necessarily be able to... Um, you know, some of them are quite good at diagnosing dementia and some probably are not as good. However, it's, it, those are the kind of people that you can see. Also, geriatrician, by the way, um, are also very good uh, kind of people to, uh, to get an assessment. Okay, um, May Yap has asked um, if you have any suggestion for leg cramps while sleeping. So um, cramps, anything to take. Uh, okay, it's, it's not about what to take. It's about finding out what is causing the leg cramps in the first place. So multiple things cause leg cramps. Um, it's very common in the elderly. Um, it's to do, so first thing is you need to make sure that it's not a circulatory problem. Peripheral vascular disease, that's why you don't have a very good blood supply to your feet, um, can cause leg cramps. Secondly, it's a lack of exercise. Uh, thirdly, it's too much exercise, uh, standing up too much. Um, other things is deficiencies in certain vitamins, so magnesium, sodium, uh, zinc, 
So those kind of things can also cause leg cramps. So before you, I can suggest something what to take for leg cramps, it's better to also um, check why you have the leg cramps in the first place. Some medication can also cause leg cramps to check that it's not something your doctor prescribed you. Um, and treatment can include, so there, there are some medication uh, that you can take, uh, gabapentin, uh, diotizem, quite a few medications. But most, most importantly, always find out what's causing the leg cramps. Sometimes the cramp, you know, after checking, you still can't find the cause of the leg cramps. But you can do things like massages, um, exercise, always stretching your calf muscles. Those kind of things can be quite helpful. Next okay. question. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dr. Wan Iswin and uh, Ms. Tan, uh, that's all the time we have for, uh, okay. for the Q&A today. Once again, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank the both of you for your time today and for sharing uh, a very interesting and insightful uh, talks with us as well. So thank you very much again, Ms. Tan and Dr. Wan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.